started. Thank you everyone for coming in today. The weather made it a little bit easier of a decision, I think, than last week. So today I am going to tell you about compact binary formation, how we form the kinds of compact binaries we're looking for with LIGO. And also to understand that better, we're going to need to look at uh, individual star, uh, stellar evolution and how stars form and evolve throughout the course of their life as well. Uh, so first things first, uh, we have sound, which I'm very excited to bring you. <laughs> So it wasn't my fault, uh, but it's a, it's a good analogy for the whole uh, topic of this lecture. We finally added a soundtrack to the electromagnetic show you've been getting up until now. All right. So uh, a quick, quick review of what we went over last week, this time with sound, because I think it's really cool to be able to hear this stuff. The types of, of gravitational waves we're looking for fall into four major categories. Continuous waves are these sinusoidal waves that I had mentioned last week. They're due to things like hills on neutron stars and are just a constant frequency and a constant tone uh, that accompany things like pulsars that we already see in electromagnetic light. This is what the gravitational wave can look like from these types of sources. It's just a sine wave with some frequency. And that's the sound. It sounds like the speaker's broken, but it's just a 60 hertz sine wave. That's what the gravitational wave would, look, would sound like and look like from the crab pulsar, the pulsar in the middle of the crab nebula, if there happens to be some asymmetry. Now, I had mentioned before that this is a tough one to find. Because the gravitational waves happen at 60 hertz, which is where our power lines also oscillate, we get lots and lots and lots and lots of noise in our detectors at that frequency. So this is a particularly hard one to look for, but other pulsars uh, have different frequencies for their gravitational waves and are easier to search for. But that's what a continuous wave can sound like with different frequencies. Yes? Lights. Lights? Would you like to down a little bit? Yes. Is that okay for the video? About a half a medium. Okay. All right, good. Everybody kind of happy? <laughs> All right, first sources. So these are things like supernovae and other types of short duration bursting things that we don't have great calls for. Uh, this is what it sounds like. Pretty cool. Hard to find though because our instrument also makes noises like that. And then finally, the stochastic background, which is due to things like compact binaries that I've been talking about a lot about, but it's the composition, it's the superposition of all of the binaries that we could ever be sensitive to in the entire universe. And so it's this addition of all these individual sources that we can model that all mush together and make this background noise. <laughs> why I have a job. <laughs> All right, and then finally the, the compact binary signal. So this is that chirp that, that we always talk about uh, with gravitational wave detection, and that's what we've detected so far. These are easier to detect. Our detectors do make noise that look like this too, but our model is much stronger for this type of signal, and so it's a lot easier to pull it out and to separate it from the noise. And I'll go into details uh, two weeks from now, I think, on the techniques we use for data analysis and how we get confidence in our detections and how we can actually do astrophysics with our detections, how we extract all the information out of the signal once we detect it. But right now, the, th the thing to know is it's a chirp. It spends a long time at low frequencies and low amplitudes, and as the binary in spirals, it gets closer and closer together, which causes the frequency of the gravitational wave to go up. But as they get closer together, the distortions of space-time get greater, the amplitude goes up, and it goes faster and faster and faster until the two objects merge and form a final black hole that rings down. So that's that chirp signal. And this is what it sounds like for the detection that we've made, GW150914, for a high mass source. Just a little thump. So it's really hard to hear because our ears, so first of all, the speakers aren't that great at playing these low frequencies, but also our ears aren't great at picking them up either. And so if we go to lower masses, so instead of binary black holes, we have binary neutron stars, which are about the mass of our sun, instead of 30 times the mass of our sun, then we get a very different chirp structure. It spends a lot more time in the frequency band that LIGO is sensitive to. So at 40 hertz, 50 hertz, 60 hertz, we spend a lot of time there, multiple seconds, tens of seconds. The sound is actually playing right now, you can't hear the lowest frequencies. But as it progresses, you can start to pick it up. That's the chirp. All right. 
sound. That's great. Okay, so now on to how we form these binaries and how we know uh, that, they, first of all, why we theorized they existed before we detected them and what we stand to learn from detecting these binaries, from being able to characterize them, what we can, how that can feed back into what we understand about stellar evolution and compact binary formation. So this is a, a computer simulation of the evolution of a star like our sun, so one solar mass. Um, there's gonna be a, a time bar down here that's going to progress to take you through the lifetime of the star. You'll notice if you watch it, it's gonna speed up and slow down because they're basically skipping through the boring bits. Um, and then I put some bigger numbers here in here so you can tell what, where it is. So it's gonna start off at the main sequence where it's born. Um, and it's very similar to what we see the sun like today. It's going to evolve to somewhere around 6 billion years at this point and 12 billion years toward the end. So keep an eye on that time axis, the, the total duration of that time, because it's going to change for different mass stars that I'm going to show you next. And finally, the camera is going to effectively zoom out. It's going to move backwards as the star evolves because the radius is going to be changing all over the place. And so there's these very faint rings that are giving uh, rings of constant radius. And so you can watch as that star expands through all those rings and the camera is panning out and zooming in. So here we have our sun happily rotating, sitting on its main sequence, nice and yellow. And down here it's progressing. It's at about two and a half million years old now. Getting older. Notice this ring right here is starting to get bigger. So it's starting to fill up that ring. So the camera is panning out, zooming out. The star is slowly increasing in radius. Notice the color starts to change. So this ring is about three solar radii. So it's expanding to fill up about three times its current volume. It's getting redder, expanding larger and larger. So that's, that ring is 10 solar radii. Bigger yet, that's about 30 solar radii. <clears throat> it started eating planets at this point. That's about 100 solar radii. So everything but maybe Mars is gone. And then it shrinks down again quickly. Now it's back at 30 solar radii. Bigger and better. all the way down to about 0 0.01 solar radii. So there's a whole lot that happened in that video. Um, over the course of billions of years, so it took astronomers a while to figure out this process, how it happens and why it happens. And so this is just the, the evolution of a single solar mass object, of one star like our sun. So now this is the same kind of simulation for something that's 10 times the mass of our sun. Notice first the color. It's already it's very blue. It's not yellow like the sun. These things are more massive and more hot, and that changes the spectrum, the, the color of the star. And so the more massive things tend to be bluer. Uh, notice the axis down here. Much shorter amount of time over this whole simulation. We end the simulation at 160 million years. So we start its evolution. You'll notice many things in common with the, the one solar mass star, but some things are different as well. So to give you an idea of size, this ring right here is 10 solar radii. It's starting to fill up that 10 solar radii. So right now we're just getting to about 30 million years. It just got really big. It's about 400 solar radii. Smaller, smaller yet. <laughs> Going all over the place. So if you look at the handout, this is why I say that they uh, live fast and die young. That big explosion, and we're left with a pulsar at the end. So a neutron star with a strong magnetic field that causes beaming of the radiation coming out of the star. And that radiation has an axis that's tilted with respect to the rotation axis, 
and it creates that lighthouse effect. And so the crab pulsar that I showed previously is an example that was formed through this kind of process. Uh, and then finally, a very massive star. So this is 20 solar masses. The whole duration of the simulation is only 10 million years. This line right here is 20 solar radii. So it's even more blue than the last object. We're at about 3 million years right now. Slowly expanding. We're at about 7 million years now. It's starting to run out of fuel. The big red giants. Another supernova. And this time we have a black hole at the end. So the mass of the starting star, that progenitor of the compact object at the end, the, the mass of that star has a lot to do with what it ends up turning into at the very end of its life. So we had the one solar mass star. We saw that that shrunk down to about 0.01 solar radii, but it wasn't a neutron star, it wasn't a black hole. That was what we call a white dwarf. And so that is a very, very faint, fluffy, compact object. So it's still compact, more compact than any star like we've uh, seen at the beginning of all these videos. But it's, it doesn't have any more fusion going on in its core, it's just thermally radiating. And so it's very, very faint and very, very tiny. <coughs> That's going to be the end state, we think, of our sun. The 10 solar mass starting star uh, progressed through life much faster, uh, and it turned into this neutron star at the end, as, uh, we saw as a pulsar. And then finally, these 20 solar mass objects and greater are most likely to turn into black holes. And that's how we can get the types of objects that made up GW 1509-14. And we know it has to do with the density of the particle and gas at the beginning. It has to do with the mass of the star at the beginning. No, 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 before that, before that. How it forms? Yeah, that's, the bigger so, bigger was more dense. Yeah, so the stars are initially formed from some big molecular cloud, so some big cloud of dust, basically, and then more it, dense. it collapses under its own gravitation. But more dense would cause? Uh, more massive and more dense, a little bit of both. There was another question? Yes. Yeah. How, do we know the upper limit of how massive the star can get? No, we don't. So we, we are, every, so every few years, I would say, we kind of get surprised again by finding a more massive star. Um, hundreds of times the mass of the sun we've seen. So they get pretty big, and they don't live very long. And that's why it's partly why it's hard to find them, because they live for such a short amount of time that just makes there being far fewer if we look over the, the, the span of the galaxy. It's far, we're far less likely to see those kinds of things if they don't live very long. <clears throat> All right, so we've learned a lot of, oh, wait, <coughs> sorry, yes? Uh, the star is an example Sirius with a white dwarf and a uh, star, kind of like our, the, the little bit hotter bigger. That's right. The age difference in the two stars are, could be immense then, in well, a binary. So the, the, it depends on how they're formed. If they're formed out in the vacuum of space, away from yeah. things like this globular cluster I'm about to talk about, then we do think that they form around the same time, but they get to the end stages of their evolution faster if they're more massive. But Sirius is not that big. Sirius is not that big, that's right. But the white dwarf is going to be very old. So the white dwarf, um, so the, the details get messed up in a binary system. So I'm going to go into details about that uh, in a bit. But the being in a binary makes them not evolve like I just showed, um, because there's, this, there's interactions and things that can change the evolution. Yes? So theoretically, then there is an enormous number of these tiny little black holes. And uh, so uh, I guess in gravitational waves, are the only way of detecting those? Or? Yeah, so we do think that there are lots of black holes out there. They're formed pretty quickly once you have some stellar population that, that's formed, because those really massive stars burn out quickly, explode, make these black holes. So we do think there are lots of black holes out there. Some of them are in binary systems, which I'm about to go into details of. And if they have a stellar companion that's not a black hole yet, it can shed mass onto the black hole. And as it does that, that matter gets heated up and emits light. And so we can see that. We can see evidence that a black hole is there by seeing the, the effect of matter around it. 
Um, if it's a single isolated black hole, not in a binary system, it's much harder to detect. And so we can detect it through gravitational waves if it interacts with something else again. Or we can get really lucky and look for lensing effects. So if you have some stellar object behind it, and the black hole is in between us and some really bright object, as that black hole passes in between us, we can see this weird lensing effect that happens from the strong gravita uh, gravitational influence of the black hole. And so we can watch for stars to, to flicker as something moves across them. So we can use that to detect things like black holes. We can also use it to detect things like rogue planets that got stripped away from their host star. And so that's the, basically the best chance I think we have of detecting those things, but there's not another stellar companion there to, to make matter right up. In this representation that you just shown, what does the color represent? Uh, yes, so the, the color is um, largely dependent on the mass of the star, but what it really represents is the temperature of the star. So the hotter it gets, the bluer it gets. And so by looking at the color, we can actually learn a lot about what that star is and, and uh, its mass. So the way we're going to learn about that is we can look at these objects called globular clusters. There are an immense number of stars, millions and millions of stars, hundreds of millions of stars, in a very dense object. And this is Omega Centauri. And if we look at them, the, the cool thing about globular clusters is we think that all these stars basically formed at the same time. So it's a snapshot. At, at, at what the distribution of stars looks like when you had a huge range of masses in the beginning and we look at it some later time to see what the population looks like. So we zoom in on a part of Alpha Centauri. Notice there's lots of different colors going on here. We have these really blue guys over here. We have some red ones over here. We know already that that's giving us hints at the mass of this thing and how hot they are. The way we get these colors, by the way, is uh, our CCDs are usually <coughs> just sensitive to light. They just give us a brightness. And if we want to get color information out, we use a bunch of filters to build that up. So if we put on a filter that only allows red light, we get an idea of how red, of where the red objects are. And we do the same thing for green, we can do it for blue, and then we add them all together to get that composite image. This is often the kinds of uh, pictures you see from things like Hubble Space Telescope, are these types of composite objects where they've done multiple filters, added them together. They even show <laughs> x-ray and radio uh, images on top of one another by giving them this false color in the same way. So there's our, our, our zoomed in view of Omega Centauri. And we can sort this by color. So now we put everything blue on the left and evolve all the way to very red on the right. And then we can sort in the other direction by brightness. And we get something very structured out, very clustered. So this is giving us some hints at the way that stellar evolution happens. So down here on the very red and faint end, we have a whole bunch of stars, and we have this line that goes up. It goes to bluer and bluer, brighter and brighter objects, and then it stops. And then we have this, this kind of line over here of objects, and then we have up here this other line of really blue, bright objects. And so this is showing us different phases of different stars. So down here is the, what we call the main sequence. This is where our sun is right now. This is where stars, after they form, spend most of their life. So this is where a happy, hydrogen burning star sits. And it goes for some amount of time, so for some amount of color, to bluer, bluer, brighter objects until here it turns off. So if we looked at a freshly formed uh, globular cluster, we would see that line continue up to around here or so. But what has happened, remember those blue objects are much more massive, much hotter. They live fast, die young. So up here, since this globular cluster is not just born, it's pretty old, Everything that was up here on the main sequence has run out of hydrogen fuel and started evolving off the main sequence. And we see some leftover evidence of that. And then that evolution leads to stars progressing kind of around this track over to this part here where we see these guys. And then down here where you can just see some really blue faint objects. So this is also how we age globular clusters actually. If you take an image of a globular cluster, you do all this sorting, you look for where the main sequence ends, that gives you a nice measure of how old that globular cluster is because you know what mass the star must have been around there and how long they spend on the main sequence. So once they evolve off the main sequence, we hit the subgiant phase right here. So this is where they start to run out of that hydrogen fuel that's sustaining the star up until that point. And we start getting different chemistry happening, different fusion happening. We move into that red, red giant branch where they get really red, really big, really fluffy. And then they evolve over the horizontal branch here to get to that nice blue bright section where they don't spend much time because we don't see very many stars up there. 
and then they cool off and form these white dwarfs down here that eventually our sun will do. So this diagram is called the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. And so, again, it's showing the color on the x-axis. Uh, we show blue on the left, red on the right, and brightness on the y-axis. And from that, from this kinds of study, we've learned that young stars can last a long time. So our sun, for example, is going to last a long time. Um, and then these massive stars evolve very quickly off that main branch, off that main sequence, and progress through those different phases that I mentioned. So this is showing you the internal structure of a range of different uh, mass stars. Here we have the sun-like star of one solar mass. We've got this core here where hydrogen is being fused into helium. And then we have this radiative zone where there's no fusion happening, but the radiation generated from that fusion of the core is radiating through that layer to get out to this outer layer, which we call the convection zone. We call it convection because it's um, being stirred up. The, basically, you have stuff from the surface that's getting circulated down into the lower, uh, lower layers of the sun here, and vice versa, stuff that's getting kicked up to the surface. Um, for less massive objects, these red dwarfs down here, it's basically the core where the, the fusion is happening, and then one gigantic convection layer. This has a big impact on what the star looks like to us. If we look at the spectrum of the star, it's kind of a fingerprint of the different chemicals that are in there. Fusion is creating heavier elements. Astronomers call it basically everything heavier than hydrogen metal. And so we see lots of uh, effects of metallicity in these stars because that core fusion is making these heavier elements. And then the convection kicks those up to the surface so that we can actually see their imprints. And then finally, we have these really massive guys here, these blue giant stars. So they have a gigantic uh, core where the fusion is happening, a large convection zone, and then a radiative zone on the outside. So all of this has a lot to do with how the star looks to us, where the metals are, what we see spectra of when we look at these things. And the way that they balance out, the, what drives all of this stellar evolution and the behavior as these things evolve, uh, like we showed in those videos, is what we call a hydrostatic equilibrium. And that is the balance of this radiation pressure from the fusion that's happening at the core balancing the star's self-gravity and keeping it from collapsing. So as you burn hydrogen in that core, you're creating all this pressure through radiation, and that's balancing out gravity and keeping the star from collapsing. Eventually, you start to run out of fuel. You lose that pressure that's supporting the star, and that triggers different evolutionary steps depending on the mass of the star. So if we go back here to this uh, video of the sun evolving from the main sequence, we'll show the, the progression on that plot that I showed before, that color versus brightness. Uh, I'll show you the, where it's going along its evolutionary track. So this circle is showing where the sun is right now, happily on its main sequence. And as it's evolving, so it's burning hydrogen in the core. It's burning hydrogen, burning hydrogen, making helium. Eventually, the core starts to run out of hydrogen. And you start having this inert uh, helium core, and, and the star is not able to burn that helium yet. And so then, to keep fusion going, to keep from collapsing under its own gravity, that fusion starts to get to larger and larger, larger and larger radii. And it's burning, not in the core now, but a little bit outside of the core. And you start burning up the hydrogen that you find there. And that keeps on progressing until you keep getting out to further and further radii. You start having less and less hydrogen to burn. You're losing that radiation pressure that's supporting the star from collapsing. And that, so as that happens, it gets fluffy. You start pushing the fusion to further and further radii. It starts getting the star bigger and fluffier. That's why the radius is going up. And the opacity is going up as well, which is making it redder. It's blocking the, the amount of light that's coming out. Um, and then eventually, you run out of hydrogen to burn. And as that's happening, the core is getting so hot and so dense that it's actually able to start burning helium. And right now is when we trigger helium fusion. So the core is now able to burn helium. It starts burning that helium that was produced from the hydrogen fusion. But there's a lot less helium than there was originally hydrogen. So it progresses through a similar track that it just did, but much faster. And eventually it runs out of being able to burn helium. And that's when it goes on to that horizontal branch. It shrinks down a whole lot. And fusion is basically over. There's nothing left that the star can fuse. And so it has this very tiny white uh, remnant object that we call a white dwarf. But there's no more fusion, just thermal emission. It's leftover remnant heat from all the fusion that happened throughout its life. OK, so binary stars. That's what we're here for. Uh, this whole evolutionary uh, track was all true just when the stars are on their own. 
when you have binaries, which is what we're looking for with LIGO, we need two dense objects orbiting around one another to create gravitational waves. Uh, the, the, the ones that are easy to detect that we've had detected so far. Um, and binary interaction can drastically change what happens. Uh, so I've already talked a little bit about globular clusters. I am not going to focus on globular clusters because those are not uh, a place where stars usually live without interacting with other stars. They're very, very dense environments, and that really changes the evolution and also the types of binaries you form in those kinds of systems. So next week, you'll hear more about globular clusters. Um, today, I'm just going to talk about the field. And the field is what we call any uh, uh, stellar population that's not dense, so not globular clusters. This is most of the Milky Way galaxy is what we would call a field. And so I'm going to talk about this, where we have binaries. If they are binaries, they formed together. They weren't formed through dynamic interaction, which is what happens in globular clusters. So these two stars that I'm going to be talking about form from the same molecular cloud and evolve uh, together from the very beginning. So binary interactions, the way that they can change this evolution. So, sorry, is there, are there any questions yet? Yes? Just going back to the evolution. Yeah. Or you don't have to change the slide. Okay. So, a star can start out like one solar mass, but then can it ever start out more of a red giant, or it just has to go right to blue? It, it basically has to start out as a main sequence star, because um, unless you have some very strange composition to your cloud that formed the star, it's pretty much all hydrogen. And so this track is basically what happens if you have a whole bunch of hydrogen that comes together and forms a star. It has to start off on that main sequence and burn until it runs out of hydrogen. And that's what triggers the, the progression after that. All right, any other questions? OK, so now we're going to talk about how that can change, how being in a binary can change that progression. <coughs> um, so you have two, con uh, sorry, two stars that are orbiting one another, initially far apart. They start off at some point on the main sequence, different depending on what their mass is. Uh, this is showing here. We have a lighter object over here that's more yellow, and a heavier object over here that's more blue and larger radius. As the star progresses, as it eventually burns through its hydrogen and starts to eventually burn helium and things, it gets big. Remember, we get the red giant phase that happens. When that happens, it gets big and fluffy. And as you get big and fluffy, that, the gravity at the surface, the surface gravity of that star goes down. And so the, the gas that's on the very outside of that star, as it gets bigger and bigger, becomes less and less bound gravitationally to the star. Eventually, it overfills what we call its Roche lobe, which is that um, extreme point where if it gets bigger than that, the gas at the very outside of the star loses, uh, is no longer bound to that star and can be stripped off. And in that case, we get mass transfer from that big fluffy star, the more massive one initially, we get mass transfer to the less massive companion. And so this is where it really starts to play with that evolutionary track that I showed before. We start stripping off some of that hydrogen outer envelope. It goes on to this star. And so now, not only does this star have less hydrogen, which is going to affect how it evolves, but this star has more hydrogen. And it's getting bigger as it happens. So that can definitely have an impact on the evolution of these things. And eventually, this star also leaves the main sequence. It gets big and fluffy. It can overfill its Roche lobe. And then we can have this uh, common envelope phase, where both stars are basically sharing an atmosphere. And that can cause also lots of changes to the evolution of the star. So here is a, a similar simulation, and it is showing a already compact object here. So this is a white dwarf. This has already left the main sequence, gone through its uh, evolution, and it's now at its final uh, thermal radiation state. This is a more massive object that is about to evolve off the main sequence. And so they're orbiting one another, uh, they're basically going through independent evolution right now. And then that star, as it leaves the main sequence, it gets big, it gets fluffy, eventually it gets big enough that it's overfilling its Roche lobe. You start to have matter streaming off from that big, fluffy object onto that compact object. Sorry, that's a neutron star, not a white dwarf. And then we get this, this uh, mission, this, uh, these jets forming. This is a uh, X-ray binary. So this matter, as it's falling off the star, is forming this accretion disk. And that accretion disk is getting hotter and hotter as you get closer to the black hole. And it's glowing at a higher and higher frequency of light. And it gets all the way into the x-rays. So it's like a filament of a light bulb that's so hot that it's emitting x-rays. And this is where we find out most of our stuff about compact objects, especially black holes. We need to look for this type of emission mechanism. So this progresses. 
This happens until eventually the star is no longer filling its Roche lobe, and then it goes down to a white dwarf. Yes? Um, how much mass has the white dwarf lost through its evolution in the binary? So the, the, are you talking about the, uh, so the white dwarf, the thing that, that was doing all the action? Um, so that changes a lot depending on the characteristics of the binary and also in the internal physics of the star. So something I haven't talked about much is the initial metallicity of the star. Um, there's a huge range of different metallicities that can happen. And so if you go to really, really old stars, way off, not, not too long after the Big Bang, the universe is mostly hydrogen. And so the metallicity in the star when it's first born is very low. But if we go to more times recent to us, so if you go further away from the Big Bang, you've had stars that have come and created, have gone supernova, and throughout that process generate lots of different metals uh, through that process. And so when you make new stars out of that, you have different compositions at the start. And that affects the winds, which I'll go into a little bit in a second, and that, that affects the mass loss. So the, the short answer is it, it depends. Um, but it, it's, it's, around, it's definitely much, much less than a solar mass. So it's usually like 0 0.01, 0 0.001 solar masses. It doesn't lose a lot, but it does have, it's enough to have an effect. Any other questions before I move on? All right. So this is the cartoon picture of uh, the kind of process we just saw. So you have these two, uh, ZAM stands for zero A, ZAM stands for zero H main sequence. We have this row slope overflow. You get that mass donation to the, to the, uh, the lower mass object, and you shed off all that outer hydrogen, and then we have left what's called the helium star. That helium star uh, can go supernova. So this is the, what happened before that video started, to give you kind of the backstory. This is the prequel. Uh, you have a supernova that forms that neutron star that we saw at the very beginning of the movie, and then eventually this less massive object evolves off the main sequence, it gets big, it starts to also have Roche lobe overflow, and then it forms that X-ray binary that we saw. And then eventually you, get this, you can get this common envelope phase where it really overflows uh, the Roche lobe. And you get that same kind of helium star happen, but in this case, it's caused by this common envelope. So instead of having the mass fall off to the other object, this common envelope phase, because that star is so fluffy, and then you have this compact object that's actually moving inside of the atmosphere of the other star, you get a lot of sloshing, and it can actually knock away a lot of the extra hydrogen, and you get this helium star at the end. You can get some more complicated mass transfer out, and then eventually you get this compact binary that we're looking for. So this is not something that's detectable by LIGO. This is a neutron star white dwarf binary. But we do see these uh, through electromagnetic observations. So they're, they're definitely a very important key to how we've learned about stellar evolution until this point. And eventually these guys merge, but again, that's not something that LIGO can detect the gravitational waves of. This is something that would be a source potentially for space-based telescopes. So because these things are, uh, particularly that white dwarf, is less massive, more fluffy, they merge together much sooner in the in-spiral of the, the orbit. And so that causes all of the gravitational radiation to be at lower frequencies. And because we're butting up against the seismic wall, this noise caused by just rumblings in the Earth, LIGO instruments can't detect frequencies that these kinds of mergers have. So to get to those, we have to avoid seismic noise. The way to do that is to go to space. So that was a, a lower mass binary. That was the end state of the evolution of a lower mass binary. This is a, a one progression that can happen for a higher mass binary. It's not really showing up well on, these projector, on the projector. But, uh, so we start off again with our zero age main sequence, except two more massive stars on the last time. You get that same kind of approach to overflow. You get this wolf ray star, which is basically a helium star. It's a mainly helium and heavier element burning. It goes into a supernova. This time, instead of forming a neutron star, it forms a black hole. So you can think about that evolution we saw of the 20 solar mass star. And then we have the, the second star, the less massive one, start to overfill its Roche lobe. And then we get another X-ray binary. This one's a brighter, uh, more X-ray uh, binary. And this is what we would call a high mass X-ray binary, because it's higher mass. You get that same kind of common envelope phase as that other star evolves off its main sequence and really overfills its Roche lobe. We get another wolf ray star at the end. It goes supernova like the first one did, and we're left with a binary black hole system at the end. And this is the type of thing that LIGO is sensitive to, the merger of the remnants of this kind of stellar evolution. And so this is where it really starts to get interesting for us. Now, 
during that process, we hit this phase here, this high mass X-ray binary phase, where I said we learn a lot about black holes. This uh, is a uh, composite image of all of the accretion disks that we've measured so far. So these are over a range of different um, high mass X-ray binaries and other types of X-ray binaries. These are cartoon pictures of what their accretion disks look like. And from the, the details of this accretion disk, we can learn a little bit about the black hole that's at the center. So until LIGO detected gravitational waves, this was the only way we could learn about stellar mass black holes, about the black holes that are about the size of our sun. Um, and the way that we learn is by having very, very, very detailed models of the behavior of these accretion disks. So from general relativity, we have a, a very complicated picture for what the orbits of things actually do around black holes. Um, if you get far enough away from the black hole, it behaves just like any other massive object, and you can get nice, stable, circular orbits out. If you get closer and closer and closer to that black hole, the gravity stops behaving as Newtonian as it does when you're far away, and the details of the orbits start to change. And eventually you get close enough to the black hole where general relativity doesn't allow stable circular orbits anymore. And you have these plunge orbits where things basically fall in very quickly to the black hole once you go past that radius. So we have this um, outermost, uh, sorry, innermost stable circular orbit, we call it ISCO. And we, the, one of the assumptions that go into these models is that the inner edge of that accretion disk is at the ISCO. It's at that innermost stable circular orbit. And once the particles go past that, they fall in very quickly. So you don't have that stable uh, accretion disk anymore. So you have this well-defined inner edge of an accretion disk because of general relativity. And that is dependent on the mass of the object. So that's how we can estimate, for example, the mass of the object and also all of the details of the black hole go into there. So most importantly, the spin of the black hole can aff affect where that inner edge is. And so from that is how we especially learn about spin of black holes up until now. But the details of that are so complicated and the models depend on so much uh, assumption that a lot of people don't really believe the spin estimates that come out of that. And so they've been waiting for gravitational waves to come along and really give a proper estimate of spins because we don't have these kinds of assumptions. We don't have to model accretion disk physics and the emission of accretion disks and the ray tracing of light emitted by the accretion disk in a uh, strong field general relativity uh, type model. So anyways, that's how we've learned about black holes up until now. Yes? So with these uh, reverse loads that start the whole process, um, the definition of that radius, it seems like it must be related to some kind of a, uh, an equilibrium question with the other, the attractive equilibrium and the attraction. Because otherwise, right. I mean, there, it's like there, nothing ever really is completely gravitationally unbound because gravitational range is infinite. So there must be some other concept. So it's, it's a balance of the gravitation. This point right here that's labeled as the Lagrange point is the easiest one to understand. And that is where the gravitational pull from this object exactly cancels out the gravitational pull from that object. Okay. And so once you go outside of that, that's when things start moving around. So if you have some particle that starts off on this star, well within its Roche lobe, it is gravitationally bound to the, that star. Once you get, if you're moving out in radius away from that toward this Lagrange point, eventually you hit that Lagrange point, and it will just sit there. If it's exactly at the Lagrange point, it will just sit there. And then if you have some photon comes along, knocks that particle toward the other star, then it's now gravitationally bound to this star, and it falls so to that star. in the case of two black holes, as they orbit each other and get closer and closer, why don't you have a similar kind of, a, of, a, of an effect? Well, because it's so we don't usually put matter around uh, a binary black hole system. If you had accretion disks or something, then eventually you'd get this kind of picture, and you'd have something like a Roche lobe where maybe the accretion disks would start donating matter to the other black hole. Yes? Can the model that you present for the creation of a binary black hole, can it produce black holes as massive as what I would have depicted in the merger? Yes, with some caveats. So they are very massive black holes, and I'll go into that in a second. Um, but they're, they're 30 something solar masses. So one of them is 36 solar masses, we think. And to form a black hole that massive means that we needed a very, very massive uh, progenitor to form that black hole and still have that much mass left over after a supernova. And so we can generate black holes that large, we think, but it, it, it has some constraints on the internal physics and particularly the metallicity 
of the stars that went in to make that black hole. So it's, it's a, we learned more from just the mass of these black holes than we thought we would from the first detection because they are so massive. All right, get back up. All right, so that is the A particular channel of how we could form binary black holes. And so the details of this evolution can vary wildly depending on the different kinds of physics that go into how the stars are formed, how they evolve, how they interact. And so by detecting lots and lots and lots of compact binaries, we can start to put constraints because different formation channels have different imprints on the physics, on the, on the details of that final binary, compact binary that's formed at the end. So things like the masses of these black holes give us clues about some of the physics that happened up until their formation. The spins of these objects and the orientations of the spins also give us some information about the channels that these things took to be formed. And so that is, that, that's one of the most interesting astrophysical things we can do once we detect these compact binaries, is use that to inform the kinds of physics that we don't really know very well yet. And so this is a diagram of uh, one set of authors, how they thought the uh, compact binary like GW150914 could be formed. And so this is specifically in the picture of a field binary. So there's no dynamical capture of objects. These things were born together, evolved, and died together. So we start off here in a, a, the same kind of uh, phase we started off all the other ones, the zero age main sequence. Um, on the left here, we're gonna have the time in millions of years. Um, this MS is indicating the phase that that left star is in. And it starts off, they think, at about 96 solar masses. So a very massive star, almost 100 solar masses. And then over here is uh, the, the lower mass companion, the secondary object. <coughs> so that starts off on the main sequence at around 60 solar masses. And over here gives the separation of that binary in solar radii. So it starts off at about 2.5 thousand solar radii apart, very wide binary. And over here is the eccentricity of the binary. So zero is an exactly circular orbit all the way to extreme eccentricity, which is one, where it's a very, very uh, ellipse-like orbit. So they orbit one another happily as they're on the main sequence. Eventually, the first one leaves the main sequence. And notice, first of all, the mass. So as it evolved uh, as, a, as a main sequence star, and eventually to the point where it got to fill its own Roche load, it already lost about four solar masses worth of material. So that happens because of winds. You have, if you have a high metallicity star, the, that high metallicity causes the star to be a little bit more opaque, and that causes the winds to be able to kick off particles and gas from the star as it's happily sitting there on the main sequence. So you get this wind of these, this constant low level uh, departure of mass from the star, and over the course of its life, uh, resulted in about four solar masses of loss in wind. So it shed about four solar masses just from the, that kind of wind effect. Until it finally fills its Roche lobe, you start moving a little mass over to the secondary object. And we get down here to about 3.5 million years after their formation. After the, all that Roche lobe transfer, we start to get a lot of mass loss. So now we're down to now 42 solar masses for that object, and this guy, has inflated up to about 85 solar masses. So you can imagine that this has a huge uh, impact on the, form eight, on the evolution of those stars. It's, not, no, it's no longer that simple picture that we've looked at uh, for isolated stars. So Roche load transfer is finished. The star has gone down compact to be this helium star again. It's at about 39 solar masses. And now they don't think that that type of star would form a supernova. And instead, instead of having this explosion that compresses the core down, to make a black hole, you basically have the entire star just collapse down to a black hole. And that's how we can keep around so much mass. So it, it starts off as this 39 solar mass helium star. It just collapses down to a black hole and keeps most of that mass during the collapse. And you get a 35 solar mass black hole out. And so over here, we still have our star that's not, uh, that hasn't reached its end stage yet. Now that star gets fluffy, big. We have this common envelope phase where we have this black hole moving around within the atmosphere of that secondary object. That secondary object is now down to about 82 solar masses because that black hole is picking up a little bit of mass as it goes around. And we evolve on to about five million years. That common envelope phase is over. The black hole sucked up a little bit of that mass. It's now at 36 solar masses. We have this helium star left over that's at about 37 solar masses. 
that star too is going to go through a collapse down to a black hole, and that's when the masses are now fixed. So now we have a compact binary, a, bi a black hole binary, where we have one 36 solar mass object and one 30 solar mass object. And so those black holes are now going to orbit one another. Notice the radius of this orbit now is at about 47 solar radii. So through that process, it's gone from about 2,000 solar radii down to 40. And so that is, we, we need that to happen in order for, for these gravitational waves to be emitted. If the binary were to have stayed at that uh, several thousand solar radii kind of orbit, then the gravitational radiation from that is not strong enough to cause them to inspiral and eventually merge. It will take billions and billions of years for gravitational radiation to have any effect on the radius of that orbit. So the way we go from here to that last stage, so they're orbiting one another at about 40 solar radii, it takes another five million years or so for them to finally merge. But the mechanism for them to merge is the gravitational radiation that we're trying to detect. So you are orbiting these two black holes around one another. They have a very low frequency of gravitational wave emission. That carries energy out of the orbit and causes it to slowly shrink. And that progresses for five million years until they finally get to the point where they merge. And we just saw the final 0.3 seconds of that process. Yes? There's a tremendous loss of mass in your fourth to the last, or third to the last step on the right-hand side. What okay. happened to all of that mass? All right, let's uh, take it back here. It goes from 82 to 37. <clears throat> so we are looking at over where? Sorry. So it says 82 right to 2, down to 36 yes. to 8. That's a huge loss of mass. Yes. Uh, and not very much time. And um, Yes, so, so some of that mass goes to the black hole, but only a few solar masses, right? The rest, yeah, one solar mass, sorry. The, so you lose about one solar mass to that black hole, the rest of it is just kicked out of the system. So you've got this bathtub of gas around the star. It's not very strongly bound. It's a big, fluffy star, and you have this really dense black hole that's moving around within the atmosphere. It's just sloshing that matter around and kicking it off. And so you get a lot of shedding of mass from that. What accounts for that uh, change in orbital radius? Uh, in red, from here to here? Yeah. So that is dynamical friction, largely. So that you have, as the black hole moves through all of this gas, there's a differential in the gravitational pull. As it moves through that gas, it has this effect of friction that slows down its orbit, and that causes it to kind of inspiral in as it's in that common envelope phase. So that's an incredibly important phase to get these things. I mean, at that point, there's still 3.7 thousand solar radii apart. That common envelope phase is key for getting them close enough to merge within any kind of reasonable time. So that, that's an incredibly important, important phase of that, that evolution. I saw that question. Yes? But the helium star on the right, it collapses too, but not in the same way. So the, it has basically the same kind of collapse that goes from here to here. I see. So that, that's basically the same kind of collapse. Because those stars are, I mean, they're pretty close to one another in mass at that point. So this one, when it collapses, about 39 solar masses. This one, when it collapses, about 37 solar masses. Yes? Yeah, could you reiterate what the conditions were, were that would result in the collapse directly to a black hole without going to the supernova phase? Without going to the supernova phase. So that, actually, I don't know that much about. Um, I don't know the details that cause one type of object to go supernova versus the other. And it may be partly the composition. So the type of, of, uh, of chemicals you have left over at that point in the star, when you, so when a, a star goes supernova, what's happening is you have, you've burned through your hydrogen, now you're getting to the point where you've burned through your helium, you have that same kind of track happen that I showed before, and you get the, the, the density and temperature going up in the core, eventually it can burn the next heavier element. And that keeps happening, the core keeps getting hot and dense enough to burn the next type of uh, element that it has left to burn. That happens all the way to the point where you have iron, so you fused all of these small particles together, all the way up to the point where you get iron. And now iron is special because, if the, that's kind of the topic of the sheets that I handed out. So iron is special because when you fuse two iron elements together, you don't get energy out anymore, like you did with the fusion of all those lighter elements. You actually have to put energy in to fuse those together. And so when those are fused together, it doesn't give out radiation. It doesn't help to support against gravitational collapse. And so then it runs away. And so it runs away, and you keep compressing that core all the way down until it just explodes and, and burns everything that it can. And that's what triggers that explosion. And I don't know, I think it's something to do with the density profile. Because eventually, if you get things dense enough, 
they, they, um, if you take some intersection of that star, uh, it's going to pass its own Schwarzschild radius. And once it does that, it forms a black hole within the interior of that star. And so if you can form a black hole out of the core of the star before you trigger that really big explosion, that's when you would get those kind of gravitational climbs because you'd have this black hole form and then everything outside of it, as it falls past that event horizon, it can't explode anymore, it's within the event horizon. So then you get this black hole that just eats up the rest of the mass as it falls in. Would that also maybe depend on the initial metallicity of the star? Yeah, so I'm sure it very, very sensitively depends on the metallicity of the star because it's gonna affect the evolution and what leads to that eventual star uh, remnant that's gonna go either supernova or, or direct collapse. Yeah. Any other questions before I move on? Yes. In the C C D phase, those those two stars are spots are wielding around. Yes, that's right. So so most of this, the material that's in between them is actually being swept off. That's right. So it's getting it's kicked around. around. It's moving around, getting so kicked out, and that's why that object loses so much mass in that process. All right. So we're through. All right, so there's a lot that goes into the evolution of these binaries. There's a lot that can happen from their zero age main sequence that they're at at formation all the way to the point where they form a compact binary object. And so how we can go from some cloud of gas to some population of binaries involves a whole lot of physics. I mean, we've been through just some of the details of the physics that lead up until the that compact binary formation. So there's a whole industry in academia around predicting the types of compact binaries that we would get out that would be detectable by LIGO, and it's called population synthesis. And so these are all-knowing codes where we put in every piece of physics that we think is relevant, all the way from star formation to evolution to explosions to mergers and things like that. All of the <laughs> physics that we think is important goes into these population synthesis things. A lot of that physics is very uncertain. We have to put constraints on it from things that we've observed so far electromagnetically, but there's a whole lot of stuff that goes in there. And so these codes end up looking really complicated. There's tons and tons of knobs and buttons and levers that you can push and pull that greatly affect the stuff that comes out. And so this is an industry, and it's a very violent one, because one group will have a population synthesis code. It has lots of assumptions that they think are, are uh, well posed. Another group has their own population synthesis code that has completely different assumptions, has a huge effect on the output of that code, and they're really both right, as far as we can tell, because we just don't know a lot of the details of the evolution of these things. So population synthesis codes are really complicated. There's a lot of freedom for the runners of those codes to turn knobs to get answers out that they want. So as soon as you announce something like GW150914, it doesn't take very long for people to twist a few knobs to get out lots of objects like GW150914. So it's a really complicated picture. This is what we're really depending on to be able to feed back and learn things about physics, about the evolution of these stars from detections that LIGO makes. So it's an important step. We just have to be really, really, really careful in how we go about it and what assumptions are made, what effects those have. And so going back is a, is a complicated thing, but we can already uh, make some important statements from GW 150914. So this is, I thought it was some weird artifact there. Anyways, this is the mask strength from GW 150914 as measured by LIGO. So this is the mass of the secondary object, that lesser mass object, and this is the mass of the primary object, the more massive one. And those are something that we measure those black hole masses. So we don't say anything about the initial mass of those things, the initial mass of the stars that eventually form these black holes. This is the constraint we put on the mass of those black holes as they're in spiral and together. And so from that, we already learned something, um, as I've hinted at already, and that's mainly about winds. So the winds have an important impact on the mass of the star as it's evolving off the, the main sequence. And so to form, to have objects that are massive enough at the time where they go through that collapse down to a black hole, to have objects that are massive enough to make that mass of a black hole that we see, the winds could not have shed too much mass from the zero age main sequence stars. And to not shed too much mass, to have winds that are small like that, this here is showing the maximum black hole mass that you could form from a star as a function of its 
solar metal uh, as a fraction of its metallicity in units of solar metallicity. So right here is the line for our sun. So that's a star that has a metallicity of our sun, a fraction of metals equal to that of the sun. And then as we go down here, it's lower and lower metallicity. So just more and more hydrogen making up that star. And this is the maximum, this line is showing you the maximum mass of a black hole that that could make. And these blue and red lines are the estimates of mass from LIGO for that first detection. And so we need to have those lines overlap in order to make black holes like we saw. And so that has strong constraints on the type of metallicity that that star must have had when it evolved off the main sequence. And so we find that those stars must have had metallicities that are much smaller than half of uh, what our sun has as far as fraction of metals in it. So it's, it's, a, it's just one detection. And from that, we've learned something about the metallicity of objects at this time in the universe. And so with more detections, we get more knobs to turn in those uh, population synthesis codes, and we can start to learn more about the, the physics that leads to them. So today I've focused on just the field uh, binary formation mechanisms. Next week, Carl Rodriguez from Northwestern University, who's an expert in globular cluster simulation, is going to come and talk to you about compact binary formation and globular clusters. Um, he is soon to be doctor. He's defending on Monday, and he will come to you on Saturday after. Um, <laughs> So he, he is on his way. He's got a prize fellowship lined up at MIT for next year. Uh, he's given a TEDx talk before. He, he's, he's good. He, he'll teach you lots about longer clusters and how we form compact binaries in them. So I hope you uh, come with lots of questions for him and really grill him. Uh, because I'm sure he won't be that enough on Monday. So uh, with that, I will take any further questions you have. Thank you. So the metallicity constrains the age of the progenitors, or is it the other way around that they say we know how old they are, and this is the metallicity of that? Time? So the metallicity is indicative of when, uh, at what point after the Big Bang they were formed. Yeah, that's right. So it, it's it's more of the age of the universe at their formation, not their age. Uh, as far as so, so, it all plays together. So by knowing the metallicity or uh, the progenitor. You know how old they are, how old they were. So you, you, you have, it gives you some idea of when those stars might have been born. And yeah. more particularly the environment they were born in. Because you can get low metals in environments that form well after the Big Bang. If you just happen to have this hydrogen gas that's kind of sitting off the side and not really going through making stars, exploding them, and making more stars, exploding them. Uh, yeah. So it, it really depends. It gives you information on the environment. And only through lots and lots and lots more detections, I think, will we start to put constraints on exactly the type of the, the time where these things were formed. So what gives us a better constraint of the time that these objects were formed is how far away we detected them. So these were detected at a redshift of about 0 0.01. So it's pretty local uh, as far as cosmology goes. It's, it's uh, basically they were they exploded about a billion years ago. And so that's that's really where the constraint comes from. And then knowing their masses, we can trace backwards when they were formed. And that's probably the better constraint we have on when they were formed than the metal Yes, in that. Uh, physicists define heavy metals as anything beyond helium. Could you relate that to the metallicity of stars? That's exactly what we're referring to in the metallicity of stars. So when I said the, the solar metal, sorry, it had to be the progenitors had to have metallicity that was at least half of the solar metallicity. That's the fraction of everything heavier than helium to the amount of hydrogen and helium in the star. Yes? Um, in the, in the stars collapsing, you talked about iron being the limiting right. So during a supernova, are then the heavier elements formed at that point? Yeah, so as the star collapses, it still produces iron and makes heavier elements and it produces those as well through that explosion. And so you get all of this production of heavier and heavier elements. It just doesn't give you that energy output that you need to sustain the star. So yeah, and that's exactly how we form. Uh, I mean, we're made out of exploding stars. That's how gold is made. That's how all of those heavier elements are made. We think are through a combination of supernova explosions, and there's also uh, a, a growing pot of evidence that suggests binary neutron star mergers produce a huge fraction of really, really heavy elements. And that's through similar types of so there's this R, what they call R process fusion that happens in the ejecta from those kinds of mergers. Those two different mechanisms, we think, are how we form basically all the heavy elements that we uh, mine for today. Yes? Yes, you. So, 
How do you put a red filter on the Hubble? So the, the telescopes like the Hubble typically have filter wheels in them. And so there's just a, a little a wheel in, the, in a lot of these telescopes, ground and space, where you can just rotate that wheel and get different filters applied. So we don't, we don't send astronauts up there to, to screw on that. <laughs> Despite all the missions we've done to Hubble, uh, that would be a little bit ridiculous in <laughs> cost. Yes? Is redshift used to determine the age of the uh, uh, gravitational waves that we detected last September? It's, it's a complicated picture. So we don't measure redshift with LIGO. What we measure is what we call the luminosity distance, which is just the effect of the dimming of the gravitational wave as it comes to us that is totally dependent on distance. So the, the strain, the amplitude of the gravitational wave depends on the distance. It's like one over distance. And so you move it farther away, that has an effect that it lowers the amplitude that we measure the gravitational wave at. So the amplitude that we actually measure gives us an idea of the distance. And then using the cosmology that we know that we've measured through other means, we can tie that to a redshift. So we don't, we don't measure the redshift, we measure the distance, and then we infer from that the redshift. But to know how much the wave has dampened, you have to know the initial masses. That's right. So there's kind of a circularity here. No, so the masses don't just affect the amplitude. They also affect how it evolves through the frequency band. So remember, the, the binary black holes have a very short duration burp of gravitational waves. The binary neutron stars have a very long duration uh, at low frequencies within band that we can detect. And so the, it's not just the amplitude that the mass affects, it's also how it progresses through frequency. And so from that we get mass information. That gives us what we expect for the amplitude, save for whatever distance it was away, and that's how we measure the, the distance and the amplitude. And redshift is also added in there? So redshift is, is added in there in a weird way. So redshift affects the masses that we estimate at the detectors. So as the gravitational waves pass through the universe to get to us, they go through redshifting, just like light waves do. And so the way that looks to our analysis is that it changes the mass that we estimate. And so you have to feed back in the distance estimate to correct for the redshift that happened to the masses. But it's all a self-consistent picture, I promise. So I'll go into details in two weeks on, on data analysis, and I can talk a bit about how, all of these, how we break all these degeneracies and actually put reasonable estimates on things. Yes, in the back. Uh, I'll take one more question after that. Uh, I'll take you two, and that'll be and that'll be it. Okay, I should maybe just ask a simple earlier. Can you kind of start start out, start out life as a red giant? Uh, I don't believe so. I think it, it basically needs to form on the main sequence, okay. and then evolve to the to the red giant. Yes, and then last question. You yes. It's not the other side of the scope, but the dark matter does it obey the same gravity laws as the visible matter? So dark matter does, we think, obey the same laws of gravity. Where it differs is its electromagnetic contribution. So it doesn't have a measurable impact on emission of light, on the production, uh, on the, the transmission of light. Light seems to pass through it just fine. So it, it's very, 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 very weakly interacting with light, but it, it uh, we think, obeys gravity just the same as, as baryonic matter that we interact with. <laughs> If it the same law, then you collapse into objects. So the, or galaxies or whatever it is, and there's no, no balance. Well, so you can get the, what, what keeps it from doing weird things is that you start off with a big, fluffy cloud of dark matter. So we don't think, at least at formation, dark matter forms in really, really dense balls. So you have big, fluffy uh, dark matter clouds, just like we can have big, fluffy clouds of dust. What makes dust clouds collapse down to make stars is interaction of the particles with one another through electromagnetic interactions, not just gravitational. And so that dissipates energy, allows them to get denser and denser to form these types of stars. But with dark matter, since gravity is the only form of interaction we think it has, that makes it very, very hard for those things to collapse down to high densities to make things like dark matter stars and, and other weird things. So it's really the lack of interaction electromagnetically that that changes the behavior of big clouds of dark matter as opposed to big clouds of baryonic matter. All right, well, thank you for coming in.